And uh, that, of course, uh, the visuals from the Moses Mabida Stadium. The EFF president, the commander-in-chief, Julius Malema, flanked there by the rest of the leadership of the EFF. And he has just uh, delivered the 2024 election manifesto, all 258 pages long. And it's going to be an interesting one to work through. But just listening to what Julius Malema had to say, quite a bit to unpack for us here in studio. I must tell you, the rain came pouring down. There was a retreat, no surrender, because they are all coming back, all those who retreated to drier parts of the stadium. But uh, Julius Malema kept going, lost his voice almost in certain parts. But of course, it is done. The EFF has told us exactly what their wish list is, what their objectives are for the 2024 general election. And should they become the governing, governing party of the day, these are some of the things that they will aspire to. And I'm still with Mzwandi Lembeche, SABC's political editor, and Dr. Ranesh Doraj, the SABC's head of research, to talk through some of the interesting points that were made. And I want to start, gentlemen, right at the start with the singing of the national anthem. And it was not the national anthem as we know it. It was, of course, the national anthem from back in the struggle days, Mbosi Sigeleli Africa. And I, I, I thought it quite interesting in some parts uh, because we said this is a young audience, uh, not quite knowing, you know, where this is going, but hey, it is what it is. The EFF staying true to their word of not actually adopting the latter part of the national anthem. Why? Oh yes, I think the EFF has been very clear in, in their functions and uh, their events. When they sing the national anthem, they make sure that they don't sing the, the, the part which includes the stem. So basically they are really, as you are saying, sticking to what they've always promised. Even on official occasions where they are not necessarily the main actor. So when, that's, when the national anthem is sung, they will sing along but when then we transition to the other part, so they don't sing. So they've been very clear about that one, no ambiguity there. And of course, it, it raises so many questions, uh, Dr. Ranesh, in terms of, you know, what's to be expected going forward? Should the EFF then move into a position of more influence and power in government? What will that mean uh, for some of our national symbols, like the Springbok? Yeah, Sakina, the one thing that I think that uh, stood out for me is that, you know, you look back at the 2019 election manifesto, they made these kind of promises as well. You know, forward wind, uh, five years later, we kind of see the same kind of or similar kind of uh, promises. He spoke about old apartheid statues being moved from, uh, you know, especially the urban areas into an apartheid museum that these things will never happen before. We're not saying we uh, totally getting rid of them, but we're going to move them to a place where our children will be reminded that these things cannot happen again, that colonial past cannot return again. And then going to the anthem, you know, the the uh, the, the anthem issue as well. The EFF has always been resolute, like Mzwai has said. They've always stuck to the guns and said that uh, we will not support the, the, you know, the part where the stem comes in. Even in, uh, in Parliament or, you know, national events, they kind of sit down when that part of the stem actually plays out but uh, you know uh, one thing that you know listening to what the CIC was saying five things kind of stood out for me South Africa first Africa is first the young people we see you white monopoly capital we also see you for all your nefarious purposes all the behind the scenes pulling that you continue to do so you're in our sight and then obviously the last one the rallying cry of this manifesto launch is jobs land load shedding all has to happen now 1994 is our 2024 yeah and that's so interesting because we've been ramped up to stage six load shedding once again and um, they were saying like many people may not be able to watch but as they usually do the EFF uh, making sure that this is broadcast on their social media platforms that are of course uh, free so you even if you don't have data you were able to uh, watch this but just coming back to some of those uh, more pertinent points I want to pick up on firstly education you know the free higher education free education overall and uh, co that coinciding with uh, the jobs and as we see people rushing onto the field now 
um, to the stage where the leadership is. Uh, so um, we are obviously, you know, keeping an eye on developments behind us as we have this conversation. But coming back to free education, and again here, the EFF advocating for universal, you know, access to funding to higher education especially, but also that NASFAS rather cedes its uh, uh, capacity to the universities, so they are able to administer those funds. Let's talk about that, Mzai. You know, so can I, they have a program which they started a couple of years ago, particularly at tertiary institutions, the program called Sifunda Ngane, which basically means we learn by force. So basically that is meant to say education must be accessed by all who deserve, not necessarily by those who can afford, by all those who deserve. In fact, he went on to say, if you have good marks, it doesn't matter whether you come from a rich or a, a poor background. So I think that program that they started, Sifunda Ngan, is basically meant to do that. So in terms of allocating and uh, redistributing and looking at how the fee structure or the funding of that education, it will be very key. Particularly because in South Africa, we have a number of challenges. We actually have a, a limitation in terms of our fiscal. So how will that be possible? Because this is not only about education, Doc. Doc, this is about also other social programs. You had your, for yourself. Social grants, for example, will be increased. It will be doubled. So there is a number of other areas that you look at. But in terms of the trust and the spirit of what he is saying about education, is basically to say everyone who deserves must access education. Compulsory education from the age of three at early childhood development level. And it spoke about, and, and, and I thought it was interesting that he actually spoke about the jobs and the unemployment in those terms where he said, for example, when it comes to ECD, this is how many jobs will be created as a result of uh, you know having compulsory education start from there, and these will be the number of educators that would be needed. What did you make of that? Again, Sakina, you know, these lofty promises are just promises. We need to see action on the ground. Obviously, this is an election manifesto. Should the EFF be voted into power, then, you know, the true test will come out. How will this be costed firstly? <clears throat> Excuse me. How will this be costed firstly? And how will this be implemented? I think those are the two things that actually need to be spelled out. Um, you've got a manifesto five years ago, 170 pages, no clarity. How? Tell us how you're going to do it. Five years later, the pages have increased 265 uh, pages now. We, 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 we just heard a couple of uh, minutes ago. But again, tell us how you're going to do it. Obviously, you can't condense all of the information and tell us now. But obviously, you know, that clarity is needed. Um, with, with, with all these lofty ideals, you know, that's why the EFF is heavily criticized. You know, lots of people from various quarters are saying that, EFF, you're making all these grand promises. Where is the money going to come from? You know, look at South Africa. Look at the demographics of South Africa. The unemployment, the uh, unofficial unemployment rate in this country is around 45%. Um, if you look at the unemployment levels of uh, those aged 15 to 29 to 34, it's, you know, sitting dangerously at around, what, 74% uh, or thereabouts. So we've got serious structural problems in the economy. And I think the ANC is very good, uh, you know, at this as well. They say there are structural problems in the economy, but they don't give us, reason, you know, a, a, a clear plan. How are we going to address those structural problems? So again, getting back to the EFF, they are spotting all these problems. Yes, good and well. But how are we going to get out of that quagmire of those structural problems? Lots of things need to change, and those things need to change now. We've seen since 1994, people, these politicians tried to make those changes, but we in 2024, those unemployment levels have gotten worse. And he, uh, uh, Malema, even spoke about 4 million jobs coming from uh, you know, various quarters. He spoke about 1 million jobs in the uh, state security, uh, 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 security, I think he's talking about uh, security guards, yeah. How are those jobs going to be created? We had Ramaphosa making those grand promises of all. Where are those jobs co you know, going to come from? Mm. We are chasing uh, investors away in this country. You know, with the way politicians speak, the kind of populist rhetoric that they speak and they push but out into the media. That is exactly what Julius addressed. Uh, he says he doesn't care. You know, essentially, those who want to go must go. Uh, also, perhaps, challenging those investors because um, 
there's, uh, there's that notion that investors are not philanthropic. They are here because there's money to be made. So those who want to go yeah. must go. Those who want to stay must stay. Why? And I think he has made it clear that his focus is the African continent, which has huge potential. Is obviously the East. Um, I mean, he keeps referring to China, and then, and of course, um, other friendly um, uh, or like-minded, so to speak, like-minded countries. But also, what uh, may, maybe may be a bit be a bit uh, in interesting when it comes to the issues around security. I mean, someone was saying, as we we're listening to saying. I mean, is he advocating for a police state in terms of how he wants to, to run South Africa? Should he, should he go to power? Should he get to power? That's an interesting question because is that what he is that what you think he meant? Because or is he talking about the fact that, for example, we all have security guards at all state institutions who are be, who are employed by private entities who we pay millions and tens of millions of rands to why can't a function like that be insourced yeah again uh, sakina you know what uh, grand promises grand promises you know politicians have to say these things politicians have to uh, you know uh, up the ante so to speak especially in front of a huge crowd like this but again when it comes to ground level you know we we, we got to dissect every word you know is there kind of substance in whatever this politician is saying? You know, going back to what Mzai was saying about, uh, you know, creating jobs, and you said something about chasing away investors. Malema said that we are not interested in industrialization. We are more interested in creating inter-trade between African countries. But again, you are double speaking. You're speaking with a forked tongue. How can you not have industrial uh, industrialization when you're asking for jobs to be created in the country? But he did say he wanted to uh, industrialize. That, that, that we should pick up on that again. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you see, it's very interesting. Then you have um, a sense where he talks about uh, protectionist uh, policies for agriculture as an example. Uh, and, and, and again, when it comes to some of those already existing um, agreements that we have, you know, how are we going to navigate those waters? But also on the international front, uh, with regard to the one China policy, policy yes. totally unambiguous about that yeah. support for Ukraine support for China support for Palestine very unambiguous but for me that, that I found very interesting is going also as far as closing the media liaison office of Taiwan in, in Pretoria to basically make a statement that we are with China and uh, we are not going to tolerate uh, Taiwan obviously we know uh, who is supporting Taiwan um, particularly, uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. has really been the bedrock of, of, of Taiwan. But, and there's this matter again, when it relates to Taiwan, of Swaziland. Yes. You know that on the African continent, uh, Swaziland still has diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Yes. And um, no, no surprises there that uh, those who are opposed, obviously, to the Swazi kingdom, so are taking, the, are taking the center stage. So, it's a very interesting situation. But I guess that is really aligned with what South Africa generally um, is looking forward to because South Africa, I mean, when they then, I think in the late 90s, so they then cut off the ties with Taiwan and then they established full diplomatic ties with, with, with China, which I think is in line with what um, maybe generally the Congress movement or the liberation movement had always wanted in terms of forging ahead.